Good evening, it is now 7.02, and I will call to order this meeting of the Durham City Council on October 7, 2013. Could we pause just for a moment of silent uh, meditation? Thank you. Mr. Brown, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Yes. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Present. Councilmember Brown. Here. Councilmember Katati. Here. Councilmember Moffitt. Here. And Councilmember Shule. Here. First proclamation is National Arts and Humanities Month, um, and it will be presented to Dan Ellison, President of the Durham Arts Council Board, and Sherry Debris, Executive Director uh, of the Durham Arts Council, um, and John Vimis, the Piedmont Laureate, will speak briefly after the presentation. And it reads, whereas the arts and humanities enhance and enrich the lives of all Americans, and whereas the arts and humanities affect every aspect of life in America today, including the economy, social problem solving, job creation, education, creativity, and community livability, and whereas cities and states through their local and state arts agencies and representing thousands of cultural organizations have celebrated the value and importance of culture in the lives of Americans and the health of thriving communities during National Arts and Humanities Month for several years. And whereas the United States Conference of Mayors has actively participated in National Arts and Humanities Month since 1984, and whereas the United States Conference of Mayors National Arts Partner, Americans for the Arts, will again coordinate this year a national awareness campaign of activities for National Arts and Humanities Month, and whereas the nation's 100,000 nonprofit arts organizations, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the nation's 5,000 local arts agencies, the Arts and Humanities Councils of the 50 states, and the six U.S. jurisdictions, and the President of the United States have participated in the past and will be asked to participate again this year in this national celebration. And whereas the United States Conference of Mayors urges mayors to build partnerships with their local arts agencies and other members of the arts and humanities communities in their cities. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 2013 as National Arts and Humanities Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance. Who's the spokesperson? You are. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Cora Cole McFadden, for this important proclamation. Good evening, members of the council and fellow citizens. It's an honor and a privilege to be the president of the Durham Arts Council this year because great art happens in Durham. 
Because great art happens in Durham, the Durham Arts Council was formed in 1954, making it one of the very first and oldest arts councils in the United States. Because great art happens in Durham, we have one of the longest running street arts festivals in North Carolina. Because great art happens in Durham, we are at the forefront of the creative class economies. Because great art happens in Durham, we have a performing arts center, DPAC, which in its very first year of operation made international headlines is one of the top venues of its kind. Because great art happens here in Durham, the Durham Arts Council established an emerging artists program that has become the model for similar programs throughout the country. Because great art happens in Durham, we have a city filled with world-class arts events, concerts, exhibits, museums, lectures, classes, theaters, film, and dance, and poetry. Great art happens in Durham because of, all, because of all the great people in Durham, the ones that came before us and the ones that will come after us. While we often talk about the arts these days as part of the creative economy with a payback on investment that outmatches nearly every other investment, we are also very successful, quoting from a brand new 2013 study, hot off the press, measuring the value of the arts, and I quote, where we are successful and wildly so is in manufacturing moments that transform individuals, make better human beings, and create transcendent memories that inform the way people live their lives. You only need to see the faces of the kids at the Durham Arts Council and some of the adults too, to know the truth in that. Thank you for this proclamation, for making this Arts and Humanities Month. Thank you very much. Good evening, City Council members, and thank you for this proclamation. Each year, the Durham Arts Council participates in a program called the Piedmont Laureate we partner with the Orange County Arts Commission, Alamance Arts Council, the United Arts of Raleigh and Wake County, and the City of Raleigh Arts Commission. Each year through an application process, we select an accomplished writer to represent the literary arts by making appearances and conducting activities in the Fort County region. This year we chose an author of children's literature, John Claude Bemis, to serve as our Piedmont Laureate. He is an educator, musician, and award-winning author of four novels. He earned his master's in education and literacy from UNC Chapel Hill and is recognized by the News and Observer Tar Heel of the Week for his influential work as an educator and a children's book author. And this evening he will share with you some highlights from his experiences uh, as a writer and growing up with books. Please welcome John Claude Bemis. Thank you. Well, although I've lived for more than 20 years now in the Triangle, I grew up in the swampiest corner of our state, uh, Dawson's Creek, down in Pamlico County in eastern North Carolina. And I guarantee if you've been to Dawson's Creek, North Carolina, you were lost. Uh, when, when people who have been lost in Dawson's Creek learn that I grew up there, they often give me a certain look, possibly a concerned look. But th the honest truth is we often feel sorry for kids who grow up in places like that places that are starkly rural, counties with only one stoplight and no performing arts centers or Trader Joe's, places with more dilapidated tobacco barns than people, places that seem so far from everywhere. But growing up down there, I had access to the most wondrous places on earth. As a child, I ran with packs of wolves. I crashed an airplane into the Sahara. I was lost in the jungle with only the screams of monkeys. And once, this is true, I went through a magic doorway. I followed a group of brothers and sisters as they pushed their way through a wardrobe full of fur coats only to step foot in the snow of an enchanted forest. An enchanted forest where it was always winter, but never Christmas. What a childhood. What places I went, what people I met. How did that happen to a boy from Pamlico County? I read books, and I mean lots of books on the bus ride home, as I brushed my teeth, while I waited for my mom to cut the eel off my fishing line. It doesn't matter if you're a boy reading under the covers with a flashlight in rural Pamlico County or in the city of Durham. Books can transport you. Books can transform you. 
To paraphrase C.S. Lewis, once children have read of an enchanted forest, all forests will forever be enchanted. I'm not sure how I was transformed when Peter Hatcher's little brother Fudge ate his turtle. And I can't say exactly how I was changed when I wept at the realization that Charlotte was going to die. But I was transformed by them nonetheless. I never again saw the world in the same way. The reality is that we grow up, well, most of us, and make the painful discovery that no matter how many times you open your closet door, you won't actually see the snowy woods of Narnia. But if we have had books in our hands as children, if we have had our imaginations set ablaze in great raging bonfires by stories, then there will always be glowing embers of wonder and enchantment burning inside us. I want to thank you all for your support of access to the arts throughout our community. As an educator, a parent, and an author, I'm grateful for the services and opportunities that you provide for our children and for our community. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so very much. next proclamation has to do with Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And Ingram Hetchbath and Aurelia Sands Bell, uh, would you please come? And you know, I can't think of your name. <laughs> Elma. Elma. Whereas, and it reads, whereas home should be a place of warmth, unconditional love, tranquility and security. And for most of us, home and family can indeed be counted among our greatest blessings. Tragically, for many Americans, these are blessings that are tarnished by violence and fear. And whereas domestic violence is more than the occasional family dispute, it is willful intimidation, physical assault, battery, sexual assault, emotional and financial abuse, and other abusive behaviors. According to the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, one in every four women will experience domestic violence in their lifetime, and an estimated 1.3 million women are victims of physical assault by an intimate partner each year. And whereas women are not the only targets, young children and the elderly are among the, also among those who are emotionally and physically scarred by violence. We believe and support the credence that every child deserves a safe home. And whereas we strongly support the collaboration by organizations and systems that confront this crisis, law enforcement officials, the criminal justice system, victim advocates, health care providers, the clergy and other concerned citizens are helping in the effort to end domestic violence. We recognize their compassion and dedication to ending this epidemic and we applaud their efforts. And whereas, since 2012, Durham Crisis Response Center provided emergency shelter to over 237 women and children fleeing domestic violence, but turning away many for lack of space, answered more than 4,000 calls to the 24-hour English and Spanish crisis lines, provided crisis intervention, counseling, court advocacy, and other services to over 1,200 victims, and whereas outreach, public awareness, and education about domestic violence is an essential element that should be practiced by local organizations, local government, health professionals, law enforcement, religious organizations, educators, and civic organizations with the goal of speaking out about domestic violence, especially for our children, in order to end the cycle of violence so that all may experience safe, 
violence-free living. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2013 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to observe this month by becoming aware of the tra tragedy of domestic violence and supporting those working and participating in community efforts. Who is this? You are, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm Ingram Hedgepath, and I chair the board of directors, and I want to just say thank you to each of you for your support. Um, about 2,800 years ago, a man named Isaiah cast a vision of a peaceable world where women and men and children and all creation could live together in peace and in harmony. And it's a wonderful vision, and that's the vision that we have, and we're working toward that goal. Um, it's a tough subject to talk about and to deal with, but we have a wonderful group, a wonderful staff um, who cares deeply, uh, countless volunteers who do wonderful work, and through um, your support, um, for instance, at Pennies for Change at our thrift boutique, I've seen some of you there, and I know some of you shop there, and that helps us uh, and helps us raise awareness. Um, thank you for your support, and uh, we look forward to uh, an end to domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. It is a pleasure this year to say to you that our theme is to honor, commemorate, and to connect. And so this year we honor those whose lives were lost in domestic violence disputes and uh, homicides, and yet we honor those who had the courage to come forward, get help, and get out. And this night, we're looking at you because there hasn't been a council member that we've called on and asked for help that you haven't given, that you've supported us, and we thank you so much for that. As well, our community, we thank you because, again, you help us to make the community safe for others. So we want to continue our efforts this year to connect, to connect in places and ways we've not connected before. We will be working stringently with our faith community because the faith community sees so many people on a regular basis. And so we thank you. We thank you for the leadership set by the, uh, the city in terms of your non-tolerance for violence against women and children and we want to thank the mayor for his leadership as well and thank all of you in our community thank you oh. Alma is uh, she's fighting me in the background but she is the resident director of our shelter services this is Alma Davis yes Our next proclamation is take a loved one to the doctor day. And it will be presented to Marissa Mortimer, Vicki, Tiffany Jones, okay, all right. And it reads, Durham Diabetes Coalition, take a loved one to the doctor, whereas our health encompasses the emotional, mental, spiritual, social, environmental, and physical, and whereas not all serious health problems have obvious symptoms, and whereas health problems can be prevented or minimized if caught and treated early, and whereas periodic screening of adults for specific problems is recommended, and whereas people with a regular source of care have better health outcomes and fewer disparities in cost and access to comprehensive quality health care services is important for the achievement of health equity and for increasing the quality of a healthy life for everyone. 
and whereas people of color consistently fare poorer on many health outcomes. Eliminating these disparities has become a national priority. And whereas the Durham Diabetes Coalition is a partnership of Durham County health and community organizations, faith-based groups, local government and universities, and community members, the mission of the Durham Diabetes Coalition is to identify individuals living with type 2 diabetes and provide education and assistance with effectively managing their diabetes in order to cut down on death and injury related to diabetes. And whereas the efforts of the Durham Diabetes Coalition to improve the health of living with type 2 diabetes fits into the Durham County strategic plan, goal of health and well-being for all. And whereas being overweight or obese are significant risk factors in getting type 2 diabetes, and whereas diabetes affects 25.8 million children and adults in the United States, nearly 12% of Durham County adults are living with type 2 diabetes, and whereas the Durham Diabetes Coalition is partnering with Radio 1 to recognize the importance of preventive medical care and encourage Durham residents to get screened for potential health problems and linked to necessary community health and social resources, and whereas Take a Loved One to the Doctor is a campaign to increase health awareness and emphasize the importance of regular medical checkups. This initiative began in 2002 as a partnership between the Tom Joyner Morning Show and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Administration. Now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, do hereby proclaim October 25, 2013, as Take a Loved One to the Doctor Day in Durham County and challenges its residents to recognize the importance of preventive health screenings and annual physical exams. You're welcome. You're so good. Okay. good evening. Good evening. On behalf of the Durham Diabetes Coalition, Radio One Raleigh, and the Take a Loved One to the Doctor Planning Committee, thank you, Durham City Council. We accept this proclamation as the city's commitment to health and wellness of the citizens of the city of Durham. We're looking forward to seeing Mayor Bell, and we would cordially invite each and every council member and every community member to join us for our event this year entitled Health Redefined on October 25th between the hours of 7.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. It will be held at the Durham County Human Services Building at 414 East Main Street downtown. <laughs> um, do join us to take part in free health screenings as well as cooking and fitness demonstrations. Thanks again for this proclamation and thank you for making sure that the City of Medicine is a part of a community of health. Now, if you would tell us again who you are and introduce the show. Again. My name is Tiffany Jones. I'm an Information and Communications Specialist with the Durham Diabetes Coalition and the Chairperson for this year's committee. This is Esther Curry with Radio One Raleigh who is our major partner this year. So. Thank you to Esther, and thank you to all of our community partners as well. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Proclamation number four. Breast Cancer Awareness Month, presented to Del Mattioli, a Durham citizen and a community activist. And it reads, whereas according to the American Cancer Society, during this year alone, more than 6,500 women in North Carolina will receive a diagnosis of breast cancer, and approximately 1,340 North Carolina women will die from the disease. 
And whereas breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer among women in the nation, and is the second leading cause of cancer deaths among women in North Carolina and in the United States. And whereas a pathology report will include information about the stage of the breast cancer, that is, whether it is limited to one area in the breast or it has spread to healthy tissues inside the breast or to other parts of the body, and whereas in the United States, one woman will be diagnosed with breast cancer every three minutes, and one woman will die of breast cancer every 13 minutes. And whereas every woman is at risk for breast cancer, even if she has no family history or other risk factors of the disease, and whereas early detection can be, extreme, be an extremely effective tool, Regular screening mammograms could prevent 15 to 30 percent of all deaths from breast cancer in women over age 40. And if breast cancer is found and diagnosed while still confined to the breast, the five-year relative survival rate is more than 98 percent. And whereas there are more than 2.5 million breast cancer survivors in the United States today, and whereas October is designated as National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And the pink ribbon is the internationally recognized symbol of breast cancer awareness. And whereas community organizations, churches, synagogues, and other places of worship, as well as work sites, can play a special role in educating members or employees about breast cancer. Now, Therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, mayor of the great city of Durham, I had to put that in, finally, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim October 2013 as Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and hereby urge all North Carolinians to wear pink ribbons in recognition of breast cancer awareness in honor of women who have lost their lives to breast cancer and also to those women who are now courageously fighting the battle with breast cancer. I also encourage women to talk with their health care providers about regular screening and to promote, to promote early detection of breast cancer by having regular clinical breast examinations, getting regular mammograms, and practicing monthly breast self-examination. Present this to you. Thank you. Hi, everyone, especially our leaders of Durham. Thank you for caring because breast cancer affects all of us. It impacts the family, and it's a very serious disease. It's a bit scary, but the unknowns of it we can deal with if we are educated. And I believe by making more people aware and reminding us all about the impact it has on our families, I'm a community advocate that loves Durham, and I know that we all can make a difference. I have with me tonight Ms. Brenda McCants. Brenda is a nine-year survivor, and she is former vice president of the National Sisters Network, and she can tell you a little bit shortly more. Brenda? Good afternoon. My name is Brenda McCants, and I am a um, nine-year survivor. My mother died from breast cancer. I learned a lot from her. I learned to get my mammograms, but they didn't catch mine on my mammogram. I found it myself during a breast self-exam. So I urge women to not just take, I had my yearly mammogram. I, I had my uh, checkup, my mammogram in February, and I found my lump in December. So you still have to do both. Um, we are having our annual block walk October the 12th at the Holton Resource Center. And during these outreaches like this, this is how I met Dill. We, uh, she's very active in our community. And I met her at a woman's home. And she's been an advocate. And this woman was, um, was going through her last stages of breast cancer. And this is how we, I met her. 
and she has been very vital in our community, you know, with helping other women when, when they're be, di being diagnosed or if they need help or if they need information on how to get a mammogram, she's been there. I can count on her. And this is why I am proud to stand up here at this microphone tonight, um, letting you know how active she is in our community. Um, Sisters Network is a national, uh, a national um, breast cancer, is the, I'm sorry, let me start again. Sisters Network is the only African American breast cancer support group in the country. We have 45 uh, affiliate chapters all around the country, and, I, and, and the, the triangle is one of them. And so we, we invite you to come uh, to our block walk on Saturday at the Holton Resource Center at 9 o'clock. This is a mighty thing that we do. And one thing I would like to say that Dale has been um, a part of is that we do one thing that no one else, no other breast cancer walk does in the country. We go to underserved areas and we go door to door. We make sure that these women are getting this information. And we, take, we invite the whole community back to the, the center. We feed the community. We have a speaker for breast cancer at that community because it's important that we know that they got what they needed because we're losing too many women. So I really appreciate the council for doing this for us today. It's very important, and we're going to take it back to our community. Thank you so very much. Yeah, I will be there on Saturday, as I always am. Yeah, thank you so much. by my colleagues, Council, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mayor <clears throat> Pro Tem. Um, as some of you know, the city of Raleigh has just announced their uh, new city manager, uh, Ruffin Hall, and I think tonight Ruffin deserves our congratulations. Um, and of course this has little or nothing to do with the fact that he is a University of North Carolina graduate at Chapel Hill where he received both of his degrees. It has nothing or little to do with the fact that uh, he worked in Durham for two years in our budget and finance department where he learned his trade successfully enough to eventually uh, be appointed budget director in Charlotte. It has little or nothing to do with the fact that one of his major goals is to reach out to the other Triangle City managers in hope of forming yet a better union, which I fully support. Uh, and finally, it has nothing or little to do with the fact that Ruffin Hall is my nephew. <laughs> uh, but we wish um, Ruffin and his wife Cindy and uh, their th three children uh, good fortunes in their, uh, their new challenge and new venture. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown, and we do congratulate Ruffin on this achievement. And if you are speaking with him in the future, and I'm sure you, the near future, you probably will tomorrow or tonight, let him know that we congratulated him. Thank you. Yes. I think a lot of people have been amazed at his accomplishments despite the fact that he's your nephew, Eugene. <laughs> Thank you, my good friend, Steve.
Prior to items by the city manager. Good evening, um, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the city council. I do have one priority item this evening. Uh, it is agenda item number 12, the street closing at uh, one, 128 linear feet of Holland Street. Uh, we request that this item be referred back to the administration. That we refer that item back to uh, the administration. Madam Clerk, would you open? Uh, are you referring, are we referring it back indefinitely or to date certain? It was a public hearing. And I just was, I didn't know whether you were. Good evening, Steve Medlin with the Planning Department. We are simply asking that this item be referred back to the administration with no date. Uh, we are anticipating bringing something hopefully back uh, sometime later this fall. Mr. Medlin, would you like to make an announcement regarding the planned um, uh, event on the 22nd? Absolutely. As, uh, as we were going through the process of evaluating the street closing, it became apparent uh, that there were potentially other options available versus just a street closing. Therefore, the administration has agreed that it would be wise to back off and come at it from a whole new perspective. We are scheduling a meeting for the 22nd of this month. At the site, we're going to have a little design charrette. I hate to use the term charrette. I know that Sarah Young will probably take offense to that. Uh, but we will be having that. I believe it's at 6 p.m. in the evening, and we are sending out notices and hope that we get uh, a lot of folks to come. Can we open the vote now? Madam Clerk, close the vote. It passes 5 to 0. There are priority items by the city attorney. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. No priority items. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam City Clerk, I believe we have someone here to be sworn in the Human Relations Commission. I'm going to move that item up. Okay. It is, uh, it is a supplemental item. So you're going to take the vote on the supplemental now to yes. approve it? Okay. Yes. Yes. Could I get a motion to approve so moved. the supplemental? It's been moved and properly second. Madam Clerk, would you open the vote? Close the vote. Thank you. It passes five to zero. Uh, Susan Austin is the mayor's um, appointee to the Human Relations Commission. And Susan, we certainly appreciate your willingness to serve. Thank you. <laughs> I, Susan Austin. I, Susan Austin. Do hereby solemnly affirm. Do hereby solemnly affirm. That I will support and maintain the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and maintain the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and laws of North Carolina. The Constitution and laws of North Carolina. And I understand and subscribe to the Code of Ethics of the City of Durham. And I understand and subscribe to the Code of Ethics of the City of Durham. And I will faithfully and impartially. And I will faithfully and impartially. Discharge the duties of my office. Discharge the duties of my office. As a member of the Human Relations Commission. As a member of the Human Relations Commission. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to the council for this appointment. I promise that I will learn fast and work hard. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, T. Order of business is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda will be approved in one vote unless an item is removed for separate consideration by a member of the council or the public. Uh, I do have one item that was pulled by Victoria Peterson, and that is item five. The consent agenda consists of number one, 
approval with city council minutes. Tri item two, triangle transit board of trustees appointment. Item three, procurement card performance audit, June 2013. Item four, inventory audit, June 2013. Item five, bids, state contract purchase, 22 police patrol vehicles. And that's item that is pulled. Um, bid report, I Bid report August 2013 is item six. Item eight, amendment number one to the interlocal agreement to provide recycling collection service for Durham County Convenience Centers. Items 11 through 12 can be found on the general business agenda. I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of item five. Second. It's been moved and properly second. Madam Clerk, would you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes five to zero. Thank you. Our third uh, order of business is the general business agenda. Um, we have one public hearing. Uh, and that is on the matter of uh, a mini assessment role for sewer main on East Cornwallis Road. I'm going to open the public hearing and you'll, you'll give us a report. Uh, Good sir. evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, members of council. I'm Marvin Williams, Director of the Public Works Department. Item 11 consists of a motion to amend the current assessment relief policy to include pre existing access to a utility as a criteria for relief of the assessment with the provision that a future frontage charge will be due and payable at the prevailing rate at the time of application for connection. Staff recommends that this amendment be made. The item also is to conduct a public hearing and receive comments on the confirmation of the mini assessment role for sewer main on East Corner Wallace Road, which was continued from a previous public hearing. Staff recommends that the assessment against the property of UDI Community Development Corporation be reconsidered and that council find that the property identified as 4601 Ind Industry Lane has not benefit benefited from the sewer improvement at this time and to grant relief from the assessment with the provision that the applicable sewer frontage charge will be due and payable at the prevailing rate should the property connect to city sewer in accordance with the amended assessment relief policy. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Are there any questions by council of Mr. Williams? If not, I will ask if there is anyone who wants to be heard on this item in the audience. If not, I will close the public hearing and the matter is back before Mr. Shaw. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I have uh, some questions at this point. Uh, Mr. Williams, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here for us. Sure. Uh, what is meant by frontage in the term frontage fee? How is the frontage calculated is what I really want to know. The frontage is calculated based on, let me go to the agenda item, I apologize. The actual foot frontage of the property that's, that's been improved by the utility improvement, that's what the frontage is based on, so the actual land-wise frontage for okay. the property that's owned. Thank you. Uh, at the end of the staff memo, it says that if the property were to connect to the city sewer in a future year, the prevailing rate would likely be higher than the current assessment rate. Is that just because of a prediction about inflation, or is there some other reason that Correct. that's Correct. It's about the prediction of inflation. Okay. Um, as I understand this, if we don't assess this property owner, the money simply won't be collected unless and until UDI connects to city sewer at some future date. Correct. We aren't passing this portion of the assessment on to some other property owners, is that correct? That's correct. Um, is this situation a common one? That is, are there other property owners in this situation? Are there a lot of them? No, this is actually a very unique situation, which is one of the reasons why staff had to go back and review the relief criteria policy okay. that's currently in place. 
Are there property owners in the recent past in the same situation who have been assessed the fee and have simply paid it? I, I don't know. There has not been. Okay. Uh, and so we don't anticipate that this will be a frequent occurrence in the no, future. No, we do not. So here's my last question. Um, it's important to all of us that we make good public policy <clears throat> and that the public has confidence that we're doing that. And this is a situation where it's important that we're particularly sure this is good public policy since it involves the company which employs our esteemed mayor. Right. Uh, you're recommending that we change a practice that we've had in place since, I believe, 1979 when the assessment exceptions were adopted, uh, if I read that correctly. Correct. And so my question is, if this were any property owner who came to us with a request for relief, would you be making the same recommendation? And is this good public policy or is it not regardless of who's making the request? Yes, we would be making the same recommendation regardless of the property, owning, property owner coming forward. And yes, it is good public policy because this policy was written at a time where there was not as much development occurring within the city limits, especially commercial development. So this is just helping us to adjust to current times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Uh, the matter is before. Oh, uh, I, I was going to say there, um, I think there are two separate matters here, right? Yes. So, um, it, it, so the, if it's all right, I'll make a motion on the first, which is the fine that the property, oh, well, because one is regarding the property and the other is regarding policy. Is that the way you said, Ms. Butcher? The, the policy would need to be changed first, and then the recommendation would need to be, for the uh, assessment would need to be passed second. Right, oh, I see, right. So you're suggesting to bundle them into this, into the, just bundle them into number two? You can, yes. Okay. So I'll move that we revise the existing assessment relief policy as recommended and find that the property has not benefited from the sewer main improvement at this time and grant relief of the assessment with the provision that a sewer frontage charge will be due and payable at the prevailing rate should the property connect the city sewer. It's been moved and properly seconded, Madam. Yes, it was second. To open the vote, Madam Clark. Close the vote, please. It passes five to zero. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's pulled by Victoria Peterson. You have two minutes, ma'am. few questions maybe for Mr. Baker. Um, I know a little bit about the state law that, um, that when local governments, even non-for-profits and all, when they um, are trying to purchase equipment for their programs, that they um, have to use, they have to use, Mr. Baker, they have to use your, your companies in the state. The only reason the only reason, unless the state has changed, the only reason that an organization or a state agency can go outside of the state if they cannot find those same items inside of the state at a reasonable cost and at a reasonable price. I have some real serious concerns that we're going to allow a company outside of the state uh, to, to provide these police cars to this city when we have a company, and probably maybe even more than one, but it looks like only one other company bidded for this contract, that we are not allowed to use that local company here in Durham, where we know uh, that quite a few of their employees are persons of color. Can you please share with us, after I finish, uh, 
share with us why this company in South Carolina got this contract. Um, also, I'm really also surprised that only $25,000. Is this a stripped down police car? Or is this gonna be a full-fledged police car with their computers, with their gates, with everything that that police car is supposed to have? So, is this a, a, a short version? I mean, a, a, not a full-fledged police car, so. Time is up. Are you going to answer this, or is the person who is responsible for the bid? Which I'll, one do you I'll, prefer? I'll start to answer start. it, and, okay. and David can, uh, can fill in. Okay. Um, thank you for your questions, Ms. Peterson. Um, the city is, is going off of the state contract, and the state has the authority to enter into uh, this particular relationship with the dealership in South Carolina, and the city actually has the, uh, the legal authority to tie into that state contract, which is what is being recommended here. Uh, as for the particulars of the um, of the vehicles, I, I, I may want to defer uh, to Mr. Boyd and, um, and and Joe, if you wouldn't mind on on the particulars. Although I think I I think you mentioned it at the work session as well. But I'll. Good evening, Joe Clark. I'm the fleet management director. The cars themselves are police models. They do not include the computers or cages or radios. We do those separately. Both companies bid on the exact same items. Can I just ask one question, madam? Your, your time is up, Ms. Peterson. Uh, and we had the same conversation during work session because I raised the same issue. Unless there's a change in state law, I believe, we'll have to go with this, this present process. And of course, um, I have no problems with doing that, but for, for right now, uh, we'll have to accept it as it is. But we did discuss this very item and the very concern uh, in work session. Thank you very much. I'll end. I was just going to say that um, during the work session, we talked about the, compare, uh, the, 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 the staff report compares um, the, the um, charger in two different dealerships. But um, after the work session, I got to thinking about it, and I asked the staff about the, the life cycle costs of the uh, Charger versus the Chevrolet, I believe. And I got a very thorough response back. I think may have been copied to all of council, but a very thorough response back indicating that the Charger um, uh, for our taxpayers is the, over the lifetime of the vehicle, maintenance costs, fuel costs, is, um, is a relatively cheaper automobile and um, in, so I'll move the item. Let me just make a comment. I was at Sport, Sport Durst, uh, it must have been Friday, and uh, no, Saturday, and I saw one of our police cars out there already. <laughs> was that good to see the car being, <laughs> these, yeah, well these are new cars, but how, how old is that car? The that vehicle that is over there is being treated for a warranty issue. Treated okay for warranties. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Clerk. Job, it's been moved and properly seconded. Um, would you open the vote, close the vote, please, ma'am? Thank you. It passes five to zero. If if there are no more items to come before this body, the meeting is hereby adjourned. Unless you need to stay longer for some reason. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you.